So what's the age difference between you guys? Three years. Three Is years. It? Yeah, I didn't even know that. Yeah, no. so, I, I know because I uh, I used to um, I used to change my ID so to be a three. <laughs> so I'd be twenty one, which was 21. oh, I get yeah, I see. Yeah, you turn a six into a three, kind of easy with some shading. So you're I three years that. old, Rick. I guess that's it. Huh. Was it was it like senior sophomore type thing or senior freshman? Senior freshman. Yeah. I I got a few questions about that fantastic Braintree High School, but let me yeah. let me ask you guys this first. Okay. When you were really young, right, and you were like you're three years older, Rick, so you're probably more into it. We got when did you start listening to music and what kind of stuff were you listening to? Yeah. Uh Let's see. I, I think my first record was uh, the Monkees that I got off of my uh, serial uh, box top thing. That's a great album. Yeah, I, exactly. I, Best of the Monkees or some sort of thing like that. And then uh, I don't know. You know, early stuff was Beatles. A lot of Beatles early, and then uh, and then in my teens, things started to things started to turn. Yeah. Yeah, you know when when there's only like a couple of albums in the house, you listen to that over and over yeah. and over and over and over again, yeah. just constantly. So like, like I probably know, I mean, it, it might be subconscious, but, but probably on the A side, every song, the, you know, on that monkeys album, you know, which one's yeah. coming next. Um, you know, the whole side basically. Yeah. It kind of went from uh, Beatles to Metallic K.O. A quick right hand turn. Yeah. It's funny because the first full length album I remember ha having was the first Monkeys record. And I had that Penny Lane, Strawberry Fields Forever 45. And my brother and sister and I, I was the oldest, we must have played that 45 like every day for like a year until we could afford another record. You know, if you, if you grew up in a poor family, you take, you, you know, my mother oh, yeah. had T Herb Albert and Tijuana Brass, of course, but you know. Right. So, um, Brian, were you like listening to the stuff that your brother was listening to? Because he was just your older brother. Were there more siblings, by the way, or was it just you two? We we have a younger brother and an older sister. Um, but uh, me uh, and and Rick and uh, my younger brother shared a room. Um, and you know, the turntable was was you know in the living room. So right. everyone heard whatever was playing. So yeah. Um, so usually something like uh, you know, I'd I'd come home from school when no one was home and or when maybe Rick and, and Bob were there and and you just hear metallic KO. You yeah. know. Or uh, a lot of Ramones oh, uh, yeah. It's Alive. We would play that on uh 45. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good way to listen to Ramones. Um, okay, I know that I'll, there's a lot of guys, and I think just Jerry's kids and Gang Green that all went to school together. Uh, who, who, like, who, who were, was this in Bra Braintree High School, was it, that you guys yeah. all went to? So exactly who was it? Was it all of the guys? Pretty much everyone, yeah. everyone who was in those bands um, was, you know, we were all going to school together. Yeah, and the lead singer of uh, Siege. Oh, that's oh, right. Yeah, they were one of the early Boston hardcore bands. Yeah, wow, that's a popular high school. Yeah, so we all we were, were all within the three year period. There was you and Bob, the oldest, then then Chris and Kevin um, were the same age. They graduated together, and then yeah. then there was um, you know myself, Dave Aronson, Brian Betzger, Mike Dean. Uh, Bill wow. Manley, Chris, and no, Chris, Chris and Kevin were. Oh yes, older. Oh, right. that's right. So they were they Kevin, were sophomores when we were freshmen. Which Kevin you talking about? Kevin Mahoney. Kevin Mahoney. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So you were the same age as Chris Doherty, Brian? I'm a year younger than Chris. Year younger. Wow, what a high school! And you guys all hung out together? Yes. Yeah. That's incredible. Um, yeah, I mean. Most of us, uh, like, I know, you know, Dave, Mike, Bill, 
um, you know, from elementary school. Okay, you're talking about and playing playing little league baseball. Mike Dean and Bill Manley and Brian Betzger and Dave Aronson. So, so we've known each other like like since you know first grade. So it's all of Gangrene and all of Jerry's kids. That's yeah. Um, yeah. I have to ask. Well, let me do this first, and then I'll ask you this question. Chris Doherty, I talked to him the other day because I wanted to just you know see if there was anything that I might have missed here. He credits Rick with being the one that would discover the music and turn everyone else onto. Do you do you remember it that way too, Rick? And and were you, what were the records he's talking about that you used to bring to the group? I don't when know. I say I, the I group, was, I mean all you guys. Yeah, I think um, you know. Again, uh, we all got turned on. I think by a lot of stuff. We all worked at uh, the IHOP in Quincy together. And we were already kind of starting to pick up instruments. And when you're picking up instruments, when you first get going, of course, it's all rudimentary. So I would suggest it doesn't matter what you do. It sounds <laughs> a little, uh, a little, uh, a little rough. Uh, so, you know, but early on, I just think uh, all of us, we were all just kind of pushing pushing things in terms of uh, kind of letting everything hang out there. So, you know, um, screwing around with playing records at different speeds because you would have that availability on the turntable. And then because early on, we'd be listening to some whatever it was, uh, Dead Boys or uh, like I said, the Ramones and then starting to mess around with speeds and then me and Bob were doing some things with a couple other folks and we were, Hey, let's write songs with no leads and kind of putting constraints around ourselves to kind of make us do things a little different. And then, um, you know, just trying to find ways to, I don't know, uh, you're kind of satisfying some hole that you're trying to get to, you know, in terms of what you're listening to, is it enough? And how do you get, fully emoted into it like like you're part of it and so that just kind of I think leads you to kind of pushing and and getting to I don't know what what the right word is but just getting to another place uh uh when you're really feeling the music and you're part of it and just finding a way to push that limit uh if that makes sense you mentioned the Dead Boys and the Ramones, where they're more like as far as the hardcore goes. What What are your first things that you remember hearing, or did you guys just I, start I it think, all? <laughs> I think I think um, I think we're primarily listening to a lot of like you know late seventies punk rock, Ramones, Dead Boys, um, Damned, ton of Clash, yeah, like a ton of guys from Braintree, huge Clash fans. Um, and then it just, it just kind of, you know, evolved from that because most of those bands were not bands that you were going to see in a club anymore. Certainly not, you, you know, you could see the Ramones, but, um, you weren't going to see the Ted Poits, but, um, uh, but you know, it just, it just kind of evolved. And I, yeah. think, I think we started that, what was it, uh. Well, the local so, stuff we started to get into, yeah, uh, you know, like La Peste and we had uh, mm. and Unnatural Acts. Those were kind of like two uh, uh, DMZ kind of in the mix there. But those were just <clears throat> acts, bands that we just uh, connected with just in terms of the kind of rock energy. And then we were like, oh, these are local bands and you can talk to these guys and I think one of the uh, things that happened was when that Jealous Again EP came out. Yeah. Black we listened flag. to it and we were like, oh, oh, that's, we didn't know if anything was going on in California or anywhere else, frankly. We just didn't know anything. Uh, and when that came out, we were like, this is oh, genius. <laughs> this is, this is kind of what we're already doing. Uh, we didn't know there was this whole, thing out there with the circle jerks and the germs and all that so yeah. that was kind of an eye opener that we didn't necessarily see a big difference between that and at least the basics of what we were doing so it was just kind of a had any, I think I think the decline 
of the Western civilization yeah, yeah. was a yeah. was a big was a big kind of eye opener of yeah. and 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 basically kind of you know drew us down the right path um because I, I remember we basically all kind of walked down to the Strand Theater in Quincy and saw that yeah and and then it was like the next day you know we we're like okay we got to explore this more yeah and we got started getting more serious I mean to them we were in various basements sharing various members yeah you know trading riffs um you know Rick and Bob were really the, you know, the rest of us were kind of, you know, we'd, we'd have a couple of our own songs and would primarily be doing kind of your standard punk rock, um, you know, covers. But, you know, Rick and Bob, they could actually write songs. They had uh, they had actually a lot of really good songs back then that were, uh, and and some interesting experiments. <laughs> I guess you'd call them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we just kind of uh uh basic theory was a play slightly beyond your capabilities. Had any Boston bands started up at that point besides, you know, the La Pests and all the earlier bands? Were there any of the hardcore bands starting up at this point? Freeze. Yeah, the freeze the, the freeze, freeze were already kind of established and okay. playing shows. Um, yeah, stains. I, there was a early band out of Worcester. If you listen to that forty five General Foods, oh yeah, 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 and they were kind of uh, they were like a faster Ramones. Yeah, yeah, um, Wormtown had their little scene going on for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So that was stuff we listened to. And I think the freeze, they were to us, they were like, oh, these guys are real musicians. Yeah. I don't think we, we were pretty our equipment was yeah. I still remember my my base was a Sears base and <laughs> my picks uh were made out of uh uh I had this uh plastic uh sled and I would cut uh <laughs> with scissors picks out of my sled because it was hard to get, but I couldn't afford to get picks back then. Yeah. We were actually soldering our own cables. <laughs> Break a cable, you'd solder it. And yeah. you'd be like, well, if you messed up, you know, you're just getting electrocuted a little bit. Yeah. Um, I have to ask you this question because I don't know these guys, but they're listed on the Wikipedia page. It said in 1981, Rick and Bob formed the band with Eric Saginov and Carl Jacobson. I don't, yeah. I don't know those guys. Uh, yeah, Eric was the next town over. He was a drummer, and Carl was a, a friend who lived up the street. So we had a, yeah, it was our probably first uh, band. It was called the Insects. So it wasn't Jerry's uh, and, kid. It wasn't Jerry's kids no. yet. No, no, no. But it was where we first started writing. So it was almost all original and i think the only thing that we we've covered um what was that band out of uh your uh, ski patrol yeah 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 i thought i thought you did um submission oh yeah maybe submission and yeah. uh you guys have good memories that song. it was called agent orange I'm yeah on, that was agent that was orange i'm on fire yeah yeah so we did a mix of mix of stuff but that's where we first started kind of writing and Dave Aronson, I should say, rest in peace. Um, right. And Brian soon came in. And then is that when you came in, Brian? Uh, yeah, I think I think um, I think uh, Brian Betzger and Dave and Bill Manley um, were, you know, doing stuff in uh, Brian's basement. And um, and I went over and and I started, you know, singing with them. And that was primarily covers. And then I think um I think I think Bill quit that and started playing with Chris and they were practicing, if you recall, they they all moved over to Bill's basement. Right. And so they were all practicing at Bill Manley's house with with Chris and and Mike Dean. And that was primarily a cover band. Um and they did a lot of Who and Stones. Um, but you know, they were, 
those guys were good. They did yeah, their they song. Really... They were like they had, um, yeah, they they were fantastic. Mike Mike Dean was just great um, at that stuff because uh, he could really get into it. Um, he really liked playing the the Who stuff because yeah. he could pound away. Um, and then I think when when you guys graduated, Greg was going off to college, so um, uh, Rick and Bob came and started playing um, with me, Dave, and Brian, and then I I just started singing from there. I was playing me and after 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 Bill left, I started playing bass. And then um, it was only a couple of months later, once the summer started, we started playing with Bob and Rick. Because I was like, I can play as bad as he can. Yeah. I mean, what yeah. the hell? This is probably still around 1981. Uh, it's the, yeah, it's 80, the, 81. Yeah, it's like the spring of 81. Yeah. Spring of yeah, 81. And to Brian's point, Chris and Bill and Mike, they were... They could really play yeah, they, they knew, anything. Yeah. I mean, they were really, really good. Um, so sometimes that might get lost in terms of you hear some first recordings or whatever. <clears throat> but Chris was a phenomenal, is yeah. a phenomenal guitar player. Bill, I mean, yeah. And Mike, Mike was playing drums from a young age. And, and I'm not sure when Bill started, but I know like, you know, he was serious, you know, he was, he was, taking lessons and you know he would you know be practicing scales and he really he could he could really play right yeah and then chris you, you'd call him on the phone and all you heard were scales in the background he was so just just do it all day just be talking to you like nothing was going on and you just hear him you know up and down and up and down we were so, we weren't burdened with lessons what the yeah yeah, we were we we would go to a show. We didn't have the like constraints and see what the guy on stage was doing, and we'd be like, "Oh, <laughs> I'm gonna go home and try that." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I know you guys ended up playing shows together later, but in the early, early, early days, did their first version of Gang Green and Jerry's Kids ever play together? Did they ever do any real shows? Um, I think yeah, there were a couple. Of, there were a couple yeah. of shows uh, early Media on. Media workshop, yeah, those kind of things. But really, we would do play for each other during practice. Yeah. I mean, we would just go from basement to basement. So, what you saw on stage when we were We'd playing live, that was times. what the practice was. Yeah. I mean, to us, it didn't matter whether we were in the basement or playing somewhere. It was what you saw there was the same thing you'd see in the basement. Yeah. So, we would go some to of each the, other's practices. Yeah. Some of the early, best early Jerry's Kids shows were probably in Brian's basement yeah you know? probably yeah was the with the first was the first show would you call it a, a house show or did you play a club or the media workshop or something like that first was it um was it I think uh, we did some party in Quincy yeah it was uh with the inflictors oh yes. the inflictors so we yeah, played you, like a basement show right? or something were they called the inflictors yeah something yeah. like that Incinerators. Yeah, Sorry, I apologize to those guys. Incinerators. Yeah. The inflictors, I know. The incinerators, I don't. But... Yeah, yeah. No, it wasn't the inflict. It was that. Yeah, you're right. So it was that. And then I think right from there, probably either Media Workshop or Gallery East or something like that. There was the Cantone show that Paul did. Yeah, because you couldn't go yeah. out. Um, and then there was... Was it a church in Cambridge or something? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I bet you Al Quint was at those shows. I should ask I'm him sure. that question. Yeah. Um, at this point, the the I'm going to just call you guys the Braintree crew. Did the Braintree crew cross, cross paths at all with the Boston crew? Did you guys get to know each other yet? Or I'm still before this is Boston, L.A. So I'm talking pre-Boston, L.A. I, I think no until... You know, until that, uh, until that, that black flag show at the Paradise, and you know, the SSD guys were handing out flyers, um, and then there was kind of some crossover because we went to the SSD show, um, and it wasn't. It's was probably the middle of the summer when when Springer came over, and it was probably was it fall or 
No, I forget what it was. in Quincy, just, you know, the general proximity. Yeah. So <clears throat> he was hanging out, especially with uh, Chris and that team. So, and, you know, um, he taught us how to sneak into clubs yeah. uh, when Spray the age limit <laughs> went up. Oh, yeah. How to get into <laughs> the channel, <laughs> how to get into the paradise, how to get into the rat. Um, which then, you know, got us into seeing a lot of the local bands. So he was a good, uh, uh, good corruptive force, I guess. Hey, it's the, uh, the scammer. Yeah. <laughs> he he so, had the yeah. scams. So that automatically, yeah, I mean, we, we're all kind of doing shows together, especially at Gallery East. I would go to a lot of those SSD shows and try to hang on for dear life. Now yeah. I'm guessing that, um, Jerry's kids and especially gangrene were not straight edge. You guys didn't consider yourself part of that straight edge thing, right? At all. No, I, I don't. I mean, I don't want to talk for Brian, but I, I didn't even think of it. I didn't even know what it was. I I was like, Bob had to tell me, I'm like, hey, what's with the X's? <laughs> I didn't. And I was like, oh, okay, well, whatever. Yeah, because yeah, I, so um, I think we were. I think uh, mm-hmm. I think we really enjoyed the concept, and uh, but uh, I think we were there was there was uh, there's no straight edge kids from Braintree. Yeah, yeah. I and think you, we were more like the don't tell us what to do. But, yeah, and you yeah. mentioned Quincy too. Springer, the Barton brothers are from Quincy oh, yeah. too. So you must have yeah. knew Dave and Rick as well because they were playing out already at that time too. Yeah, the yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we would we would see them and in, in in you know we knew them back then and they actually as the crow flies probably less than a mile from my parents' house. Yeah. Um you could you know we would go over there, you know, see them all the time. So So how did it get to the point where you guys ended up get I don't know how did someone approach you about the distant this is Boston not LA compilation or how did that whole thing come about I think it was just after one of the shows uh Mr. B kind of approached us and they they basically um did a did a story in Boston Rock and then um the story they did in Boston Rock kind of you know, turned into the Boston Not LA album. Like yeah, album. yeah they it, just approached us, and of course, we were like, "Yes, yeah." <laughs> did, did you? Somebody's going to pay for us to go in and record these songs? Okay, sure. Yeah, I know you guys ended up doing a lot of shows with the FUs, and I'll get to that. But yeah. you knew Gangrene, and did right. you know about the Proletariat and the Groinoids? And oh and yeah, we played with the Proletariat. Uh, knew about the Groinoids, uh, Smegman, the Nuns, uh, yep. all of that. Yeah, oh yeah, um, absolutely. Al Quint, you know, told me that you guys recorded thirteen songs in that session, but there's only seven that have been released. What happened to the other six songs? Um. Uh, they're out there i think somebody somebody has put some of that stuff out there i did have for that tape baked yeah to preserve it so we have all that material some of them they just weren't sharp enough we didn't play well enough on them or not not fully vetted yeah i mean it was stuff that you could you could play at a hardcore show but it it wasn't really release ready yeah some cool. of the songs, you know, they evolve over time. So they weren't, they were, you know, they weren't really ready. And then some were kind of outtakes. We just couldn't. Yeah. It's the first time in the studio. And when you're all in a unit and kind of synced up together is one thing. And you're put in this kind of uh, different environment. You're nervous. You're not yeah. really playing your best. And and there's a lot of, you know, the you guys know, going... Know. Rick, lot, you really need to follow what the drummer's doing. Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> yeah. There were a lot of. <laughs> Is that how it works? There were a lot of visual cues for <laughs> like breaks and things like that that yeah. you kind of do subconsciously. And and uh, when you're um, when you're playing or singing in a room with no windows all by yourself and you can't see anything, um, you lose a lot of that. Yeah, we were like a unit, and we would practice in a whatever a 14 by 14 space and you just have that energy and you're sinking and when you're on stage it's kind of that same thing you're kind of a unit and you go in the studio and everyone's kind of 
apart. And at least that's the way it was there. So it was, it Lou, was hard for us. Lou Giordano was pretty much the engineer running the yeah. show there, right? And then oh, Jim, Jimmy DeFore. Well, they did a those, fantastic job with us because very we had, you know, we had no idea what we were doing. And, and you know, so we were like pretty much almost on for the ride, you know, so whatever they told us to do, I think we completely behaved. I didn't think we screwed around at all. Did we? Well, there's a, that's a, there's I, a I recall <laughs> behaving. <laughs> did did you guys window. know the other bands at the time were, were record that were recording? Or did you guys go first? Did they, you know, like the freeze and gangrene, were they already recording there at the time? Um, gangrene recorded, did they record after us or I forget, but I mean, we were all going to school together. So, so we were talking, so, you know, so I don't recall exactly when Gang Green recorded, but I'm sure I was completely aware of when they were in. Yeah. Did they just have you guys set up and play all your songs right in a row live? It was, it was basically live, but we were, there was some, uh, you know, separation in terms of how they had some of the stuff. But uh, <clears throat> I think the, we did the scratch vocals. And yeah, then, yeah, yeah. I would think it was a pretty standard workflow. You run through them, you get them right with scratch vocals, and then you go back. Yeah. It's basically live, pretty live. Yeah. So how old were you then, Brian? You must, were you only like 15 or something? Uh, uh, yeah, I was 15. 15 or 16, yeah. I don't wow. think I was 16 yet, no. But yeah, 15. And Chris is Chris was also the same one year old. Well, you guys were so yeah. We young. over we overlapped. So he he would have been. Uh, I'm pretty sure he was 16. We overlap a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, he was 16, and then you know Mike and Bill were both 15. Yeah. So, so this is Boston, not LA. Was there a big release show for that? Because I was in college radio at that time, and I remember getting the record, but I don't remember going to a C, uh, not CD. <laughs> there weren't CDs yet. A, uh, a a record release for that. I'm getting my years a little mixed up. <laughs> there was no I, CDs I don't in '82. Anything like that? No, I don't. I don't recall. Yeah. And uh, I think it literally was we, we recorded our stuff. Uh, decided what probably needed to be on that uh, one tune was saved for the uh, 45 yep. um but then we just you know we just so we didn't know what we were doing so we just kind of we weren't really involved after that point yeah we were like I mean, okay back to the basement and did they uh, did they did they call you up and say we have some finished albums for you or anything like that i don't think so i think it just got released yeah. and then they wanted they asked for some artwork here and there just some little things and uh yeah that was that was about it we went about our business and then and when out. it went out then we started getting letters to the house and we we're like yeah. what the hell is this stuff um were you, were you know, surprised a letter from california or wherever yeah or europe or right when you got the finished product and you looked at it and you heard the songs you know and all the songs you know because freeze did they had a bunch gangrene i mean were you impressed with the whole thing? Go, wow, this is amazing. Or were you just like, yeah. oh, these are just a bunch of hardcore bands, you know? Yeah. Well, when I when you get an album with with uh, you know thirty songs on it, <laughs> and from all these different bands, you know, you, you know, we listen to it a lot, um, and and we, you know, we we listen to it and and you learn. You know, you listen to, you know, what the FUs were doing and now, you know, out of a, you know, you actually have more of a blueprint of what they're doing. Right. And you can, you know, it's one thing to go to the show and and hear the songs and, you know, and, you know, and be in the heat of battle. Um, but then when you can actually sit down, listen to the structure, listen to what they're doing. And then, you know, you can't help but say, you know, compare it to, you know, what the freeze are doing. And then, you know, you read Cliff's words and then you're just like, holy shit, you know, these guys, they could play, they can write, yeah. you know. So it's it was, you know, you start to, every, you know, everything was a, you know, was a learning experience from from even from that album, yeah. you know, and you're really, 
you know that that's where you really be, start to become fans of those bands um you know once you hear really what they're doing and what they're saying yeah i like the fact every band sounds different they have their own sound there's no mm-hmm. formula every you can see everyone's trying to figure it out so you listen to the proletariat stuff and they go wow that's pretty incredible the way they're thinking about uh music and then you're listening to gang green and it's like in a completely different world in terms of speed yeah. and and uh what they're trying to do and then the fu's they have these interesting uh structures and kind of double chorus type of things yeah. and what they do kind of vocally with backups was something a little different and yeah so everybody sounded you know a little had their own kind of uh kind of road they were going down that was very different than each you know you you, you identifiable style yeah identifiable style and sound um which was really which is really cool which is what we 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 saw from a lot of um you know hardcore back then is that every you know black flag didn't sound like doa who didn't sound like circle jerks who didn't sound like um germs you know the germs exactly like yeah. like everyone had their own really their own unique thing going on yeah. did you guys get on a, i know you that famous misfit show uh which is all over youtube drew stone i think did the video were there a lot of other big touring bands like that that you guys got to open for um while you were still yeah. in the band brian or did it happen after you i know after. that you yeah, yeah after was, yeah Brian, yeah, that uh, unfortunately, yeah, that would have been uh, would have been nice to keep it as a five piece for uh, for uh, yeah throughout, but uh, you know, just couldn't, the first couldn't happen. The first big show that I, I couldn't do, which I think is really the first kind of big show, was uh, was Angelic Upstarts at the Channel, yeah, right, which was a a great show, uh, but I, I couldn't do it before I, I ask you. <laughs> I, I, I know yeah. I'm gonna I figured you were at a lot of these shows. Before I ask you about that, mm-hmm. I wanted to unsafe at any speed. Uh what what was that? Was that like the leftover tracks or something from this is Boston, not LA? Because I've never seen a copy of that, but it's listed on on the internet yeah. as a release. That was a planned release with the album. They they had planned to release that after anyway. Um so that's yeah it was a compliment uh to the album so kind of like a companion so they released the album and then they released the uh the 45 with a couple of samples you know this machine uh, gun song. was on your yeah. song machine gun was on that record yeah um brian i i you know i have to ask you this because i don't really know but when did the whole thing go down where you were told that you couldn't play anymore do you I've never heard the story. I mean, of of it just says Brian broke his leg and his parents wouldn't let him play anymore. But what yeah, happened? It wasn't, it wasn't the broken leg. It was it was everything else that had been, you know, piling up. Uh, you know, me not being responsible. Uh, you know, me effing around. Um, you know, not taking care of the things that I should have been taking care of um so i kind of needed like a uh um oh what is it uh yeah i needed brian was a little out of control yeah so this is all everyone thinks that you you left the band because of you wow it wasn't the broken leg um interesting someone needs to change the wikipedia uh, page i think (laughs) yeah the wikipedia page isn't really um isn't really that accurate you know, that accurate but i mean the know, knife who fight, cares the knife fight you know? put things over the edge probably what's that the, the knife fight oh yeah 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 the knife fights yeah <laughs> knife fights <laughs> i think my you know <laughs> you know i think my my parents at the time were were like every every possible worst nightmare you could have about your child i think my parents were having that about me um and you know there was some there was some um some kind of rocky arguments in there so it was it it was it was not good um but you know part of it is you know part of it's my own fault 
So, you know, it's a missed opportunity for me. Um, I will say that, you know, after it happened, um, you know, after the shock of it happening, um, you know, was over, I had complete support from all you guys, right. you know, no one, no one blinked an eye or, you know, said anything, you know, negative about me. Yeah. Um, well, not to your face. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's what band practice is for. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, Brian's from... live performances were, uh, that was a gap because, uh, for people who got to see that he was uh just incredible and really in the moment and you know there were very few shows that didn't end up with brian bleeding in some way so i mean even when he busted his leg on that media workshop show he's on the ground finishing we did we i mean we, we were very was... workmen about what we did we were like oh we have 10 more songs to do let's keep going so that didn't wow. stop us so yeah um you yeah. you so you played the rest of the set with a broken leg. Oh yeah. Yeah, it was well, they were torn ligaments. My leg was not right. That was for sure. Yeah. <laughs> All those steps up and down. Oh yeah. You know, and then the yeah. the loading. And so, well, I, well, I still want to hear your commentary on this other stuff that I'm gonna talk about right now because yeah. I have a feeling you're at the show. Uh, you guys ended up playing a lot of shows, Rick, with the FUs. Was that by design? Were you guys like always put on the same bills, or was it just a co or were you friends or I mean, we really became friends. So we would stay, you know, we'd do a show and whatever, or maybe sleep over Wayne's house. I'd slept over John's apartment. We just uh ended up doing lots of shows. And then when, you know, we would go to their practices and hang out on Friday nights or Saturdays and just, we just naturally started kind of hanging out together and we would be doing shows together. We went on the road a little bit together here and there. And uh, so, you know, they're friends today, really. Yeah, you know, D, I, I know there up, was- When I go D up to Maine now, I'll stop in and see uh, Wayne, my S3, uh -huh. uh, even now, so. I know you guys went down to DC together and did some uh, East Coast dates together. Yeah. Um, how did uh, I know X Claim Records put out "Is This My World," which got to tell you is regarded as probably one of the greatest hardcore records ever made. I think I told you that when you were on my show with Lovely. I got to ask you about Lovely later because I'm wondering what happened with that. Uh, <laughs> But um, I got this review here that I have to read you because to me, it's the greatest review I've ever read of a, about a record in my life. It was in Maximum Rock and Roll. I dug it up because I remembered it. And this is what it says. Pusshead wrote it. An adventure into hyperactive, full tilt, bulldozing quickness and thundering power. This overwhelming supply of burning rap fire speed destroys the mold, exploding the mani maniac doses of invincible strength and energy, bolting drums, high velocity crooning, hysterically blistering wild guitars featuring X Gang, Green Axe Man, Chris Doherty. Jerry's kids totally shred the eardrums to mince meat for the fast fanatics cravings the essence of what others will try to duplicate how's that for a review yeah. is that a is that a grammatically critic sentence i don't I, it's more yeah. than one sentence but i okay. don't you know yeah it's, that's humbling there's yeah. a lot of adjectives <laughs> yeah yeah that's that's uh, humbling but um I love the record and most people do and they regard it now as one of the best records ever made. How did you come on Al's radar? I know you said you saw him on shows and stuff. And did he just say, I want to put this on X claim? And I guess he didn't tell you you had to be straight edge or anything like that. He just said, no, I don't think you. again, he, I, they had SSD weave that into their songs. Uh, but from a standpoint of, you know, we would go to their, yeah. to the, you know, world headquarters and hang out yeah. with the rest of those guys. They, uh, yeah. there was never any uh, kind of like, there was no us and them, yeah. you know, there was, you know, um, I think, I think everyone was, you know, you had, you had people that you were closer to, but, but the, you know, the extended group of, of all the people in Boston, 
it was, you know. Yeah, I think that was more of an outside thing because uh, some of that crew was so intimidating looking and, uh, and uh, more so than when you're in the headquarters and just kind of hanging out, listening to some records together or whatever. But I think Bob, Bob worked with Al in terms of Bob really handled a lot of the a lot of the shows and coordination. I give him a lot of credit for that because my my patience with those kind of things is uh, de minimis, let's say. Um, and I just don't have a lot of patience with uh, with kind of that. That was he, stuff. So he, he was really like, he really the, navigated all of that. He know? was like the manager, pretty much. He did a lot of that yeah. coordination with shows. I wasn't setting any any of that stuff up. It was just basically here's what we're going to do, and he, and here's where you need to be there. And he he took a lot of that on. I'm yeah. actually going to talk to Bob soon. We we yeah. talked about having him come on the show, and I'm looking yeah. forward to that. Um, so how many copies were originally pressed of that record? Do you know the Exclaim record? I it's think really it was hard three to... or five thousand. I think that many. Wow. But I think out of the gate we sold. I mean, we they they sold quick. I mean, I think we did pretty good. Um, but I could, again, I'm probably wrong. Bob will know exactly how many were <laughs> printed. He'll say there were five hundred, and he'll know how much they cost. He'll know who the, who printed the covers. He'll <laughs> you know he'll know all that. I'm more like, oh, yeah, that's pretty good. We're going to what? So I forgot to ask you how Chris ended up coming over to Jerry's kids for a while. How'd that all come together? Yeah. So Dave, uh, I'm not sure what was going on. I have some suspicions, uh, but he just kind of stopped. Show you know, we never had a conversation like, uh, Dave, what are you doing? Or he just stopped kind of, sh if I, as I recall it anyway, my recollection is, he's kind of stopped showing up at practices and when in our practices, and I can understand this, I mean, we would, I mean, we would practice for three hours and we would run through the set two or three times, one with vocals, one with no vocals, one with the lights off, one with the, you know, we were very, uh, it was, uh, it was like, uh, uh, intense and we would do that five days a week during the wow. summer if we were all off we would practice in the afternoon we would practice again at night we would I mean it was uh and Dave had other stuff going on and I think he just started stop kind of showing up and Chris gang green had broken up and it was just it was just a natural hey why don't you come in and I think probably him and Bob talked and yeah, we we're all friends. So it was just like, yeah, of course. Yeah, it was like second nature, Chris going over and playing. Yeah, it wasn't like a, it, I don't even think it was like a, a strategic conversation. Well, Chris has left. He should, it was just like, you're not doing anything. Why don't you just come over and play? Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, it was not like uh, some sort of uh, strategic decision. <laughs> I was, think he I, was free and not doing anything. And we had, uh, you know, we had yeah. been progressing with our, with our, uh, with our song. So we did a, uh, we did a recording when Dave was still in the band that was post Boston, not LA post Brian's leaving. Um, and we, you can hear, I've listened to those recordings. You can hear the bridge between yeah. Boston, not LA, and is this my world? In terms of the uh, kind of intensity, uh, the lyrics, the structures, and then kind of where the music was pushing to. So that's almost like a bridge recording of about I don't know, it's probably eight it's or nine tunes or oh, something yeah. like that. Um, I think that fix were on the tape, it's something like that. Yeah, there's other versions and stuff. So, but. Uh, so you can see that that was where the direction that everything was going in. And it wasn't, uh, it was just happening. It was just evolving um, organically. It wasn't like we were having a discussion around it. It was just yeah. as we were writing and then our playing was getting better. Then we were continued to push ourselves in but, terms of whether it was speed or aggressiveness. It just, yeah, everything time, kept going up a notch. By the time Boston on LA was released, I think that 
transition had already, you know, those songs, the, the, um, it had already kind of moved on. The, yeah. the, the, the style was much more intense, um, you know, even by the time it was released. So those yeah. original recordings, it was only a few months because if you think about, um, you know, how much we had actually practiced or pl and played right. uh, before Boston LA was done, wasn't really that long. We were still <laughs> fighting to put a full set together. Right. you know and play be able to play right. for yeah. you know 30 minutes so yeah that's true now um is there a reason why there wasn't another i know kill 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 came out in 87 i'm gonna talk to you about that in a second but that period after uh is this my world uh, what happened did you guys just kind of start fizzling out or uh i would uh, each of us were going to school uh um, college and then you know, one thing we should, I mean, this was a, a lot of intense personalities in the room. Uh, and so, you know, it was, it was very uh, intense environment in terms of uh, four, sometimes five kind of unique individuals. So, I mean, there was, it was, uh, it was a combative environment at times. Uh, so there was a lot of a lot of stress and going on and the music was intense and it kind of linked up with the personalities too in the room and then add that with uh, how am I going to pay rent and I got to go to school and kind of do all those things it just became really kind of hard to pull all that together so um so that I don't I don't know what the there wasn't necessarily a point where we say we're not going to play anymore. I just think it was um, everybody going to school and then kind of some of the in competing pri competing priorities, basically. Yeah. yeah. And then when you started playing together again, is that when Jack joined, came on drums at that Mike point? Was uh, first. Yeah, we had uh, Mike Dean joined um, and we were uh, playing some shows with him. <clears throat> We did a couple of things in uh, in New York, uh, D.C., um, and then he was, I forget if he was going into the military or he was out of the military. I forget what was going on or he was moving or. Yeah, I, I yeah. Um, I think Jack was playing with Buzz and the gang and we used to go see them. And then I think we just Buzz basically torture gang. him. I think we just torture him and say, you know, you should really be playing with us uh kind of thing it may have been his worst decision <laughs> yeah i think he no 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 what it was actually we would he see them he was bob. playing with them and he then bob had a side bob. project yeah. called uh something Cat cadillac or blue something yeah bob had a side yeah. project and jack was drumming for him and jack was the drummer and singer for a band called the choir boys which they put out a ep and it's it's really it's great. great. And yeah. Jack plays drums and sings and his brother and him harmonize together. And they really, really awesome stuff. So Jack's kind of multi-talented uh, person. So he was playing with Bob, one of one of Bob's side projects. And I guess Bob coerced him into playing with uh, Jerry's kids. And I remember those first couple practices, Jack was just like, you guys are, this is not right. This is, what's your problem? <laughs> Yeah, we were playing. We were practicing in a, it. in a boiler room <laughs> in in Bob's basement. Yeah, yeah, that was a oof. yeah. So that kill, was not kill. a fourteen by fourteen space down there. That was more like a you know a six by six. It yeah, was tiny. We're all crammed in a tiny yeah. space. Tell me about a little about kill, kill, kill. I love that you guys covered Spy Master. That was fantastic because it seems like a lot of bands started covering it after that. I think you guys might have been the first ones that I heard we, do it. We had a we had a live tape that a, a friend had given us from the nineteen seventy nine yeah rock and I have roll that. rumble yeah. Um, it's now you can actually get it yeah. Um, but uh, but we had that and we listened to that live performance that was like simulcast off of bcn over and over and over yeah. and and uh so yeah so curtis it's come to us we, we were just playing gigs writing tunes and uh curtis had come and said oh you you know you 
from uh, Tang and said, you know, would you guys consider putting something else out? So we said, sure. And then he said, it'd be nice to have a cover. And of course, he had a bunch of ideas on what what that should be. Uh, but we picked that song because uh, we wanted to give a nod to the early bands that influenced us. And also felt like La Paz never got a really good, solid recording of That's their true. other material. Yeah. And we felt we could put something behind it uh, in terms of, we, you know, we, obviously it's a different yeah. arrangement. Um, we did some things a little bit different on it to add some dynamics, but we really wanted to put something out there where people would say, who is this band? Who's La Pest? And look, look, look them up and um yeah so it was a way to give a nod to to those guys but the bands that were all in that in uh, kind of playing in that time frame because they had a big influence on us yeah yeah, yeah. i know paul colder he's doing something right now with those la Pest songs and there's going to be a release because yeah. he was on my show talking about that i'm very excited about that we did um, for chris's uh for chris's uh fundraiser yeah we did a short set and we did uh kill me now and spy master because kill me now i just think was really one of the early really kind of stripped down hardest tunes kind of yeah. out there at that time so we just i've always wanted to play that live so yeah. we were like okay let's let's do that so yeah I i'm going to definitely talk about that i know from maybe around 2004 to to wrap up kill 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 yeah. uh whose idea was it to take all the old songs and stick them on that record that must have been curtis right that was curtis i wasn't necessarily a fan of fan of that i thought they were really two different uh two different pieces the yeah the odd thing is i mean just the mastering doesn't even match you know yeah. what i mean it's it doesn't yeah. it doesn't really flow yeah, and Kill, 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 I mean, there were probably nine other songs that we really should have put on there that uh, just we never, re we had written and never recorded. And a lot of those songs on that record, if you really listen, if you listen to the whole channel show or what we were doing back then, half of those songs are on Kill, Kill, Kill. So it was really funny when you get some comments sometimes like, oh, you really been really changed we were always evolving um kind of moving kind of forward or trying different things out kind of musically and um so we just thought it was a natural thing but there were a lot of those tunes i think even uh torn apart we did at the Ch the misfits channel show well yeah. if you if you um there's that uh that live recording from the paradise show where Springer declares the end of hardcore. Oh yeah, yeah. That if you <laughs> listen to that, um, half that set is kill, kill, kill. Yeah, it's yeah. really funny because everyone talks about all the Boston bands becoming metal bands, but I think Jerry's Kids has changed the least out of all those bands. Yeah, is that no, accurate? Yeah, we didn't. I, you know, candidly, I mean, we didn't even didn't even own a heavy metal record. I didn't buy music like. Because I was broke for probably from from probably eighty two to you know the nineties. I so we yeah. we weren't we weren't listening to any of that stuff. So it was more we'd listen to the Bad Brains and go, oh gosh, we we can we need to push things further or who's could do in your you know, listen to what they're doing from a melody standpoint or chord structure standpoint. We need to push a little bit harder so those were the kind of the bands that were kind of pushing us a little bit to think a little differently about what we were doing so um yeah we i didn't understand the whole kind of uh heavy metal thing because I, I wasn't listening to any of that i was more likely to listen to you know the discharge record um, yeah than I'm yeah you know like SSD, to, uh, iron S maiden or something you know, SSD and DYS, and to an extent, Gangrene, they actually moved more to the metal side. I wouldn't say Jerry's kids would fall into that category. That's just my I, opinion, though. I, I don't know that Bob Sensi could play a heavy metal lead, or a, it's just not in his DNA yeah. to play that way. Um, 
he's his own unique thing that adds this element yeah that that you could never ever call metal yeah and i wouldn't call jack clark a heavy metal drummer yeah right i mean dave just... dave dave was listening to a lot of uh heavy metal and i know yeah. when that was recorded you know he was um, but dave didn't write anything yeah he didn't write anything yeah well he did do that lead yeah, we made him do a lead on yeah. that, on that song, right? On uh, Need so song. He, he got to do his little bends and everything, and in, in his uh, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. For the last like maybe close to, it'll be almost twenty years. Um, when you guys have done shows, aside from the ones Brian did, because there was a few that I saw, yeah. it was Russ Luango and Jack and yeah. and you and Bob pretty much, right, Rick? Yep. That was the lineup. Yep. Uh, I was at the uh, hardcore matinee, uh, the, excuse me, the hardcore reunion show. Yep. Is there any reason why you didn't do that one, Brian? You know, I, I, I should have, and, and, and I know we had talked about it and, and the set would have worked um, because we would have just come out done Boston out LA Right. Or 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 actually, I think we were thinking I would finish it like you'd come out, yeah. blow people away, and then and then, you know, I'd come out and do the um, the Boston and LA stuff. Um, but yeah, yeah. And I I'd always encourage them, especially when we were getting bigger shows, to come on and do some stuff. And uh, so it was. Uh, I a couple of years back, I was trying to push the straw dogs to actually do a set so i and uh ross and myself kind of raised our hands to help them with that and then they were the dead kennedys were doing a tour and we got asked to open for them at the paradise and then we were able to get ss uh, uh rather straw dogs on the show and i called brian up and i said you know we always do usually in the middle of the set or at the end uh we would usually do three to four Boston not la songs so i just said look why don't you just come on we'll cut out a part of the set you come on and we'll do uh a handful of the uh Boston not la uh songs and so i think that's the first time you did that back a couple of years ago yeah yeah Boy, and then from there we would do shows and if it made if we could do it, Brian would uh, jump on, and, and we would do a yeah. couple of, couple of uh, Boston and LA shows. Or sometimes I just throw him the bass, and then during "Raise the yeah. Curtain," he played the bass, the and or... I do whatever the hell it is I do. So yeah, the reunion show, you guys just absolutely. You you are the best band by far. I can oh, say uh, that. You don't have to say it. I can say it because I was there and I thought all the bands were good, but you guys were unbelievable that day. I was blown away. Um, I know that Brian played a show in Brooklyn because there's footage of that online. So that must have been around the time of the straw. Was that yeah. with the straw dogs in Brooklyn? Yeah. 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 Because Steve Martin, old friend of mine, too, he actually rejoined the band for that show, didn't he? Yeah, he played you, a few songs. Yeah, that was yeah. that was the stipulation that if Rick was going to play, you had to do it. That no, that Steve Martin had to play. <laughs> right, right. Uh, actually, Steve was very <laughs> he was very funny. He uh, him and I text and kind of communicate uh, on a rolling basis. Uh, and uh, I said, oh, you know, I'm going. I actually I sent him something. I said, hey, I'm going to be in uh, New York the weekend of whatever the weekend was, January, whatever. And I said, you know, maybe we can grab some dinner. And he said, yeah, you're playing. And I said, oh, yeah, you saw that. Uh, so I didn't tell him we were playing. And uh, then when the Straw Dogs got on, we were kind of communicating back and forth. And I said, do you want to do some songs with the Straw Dogs? So then I communicated with them. And then wow. they kind of coordinated which songs to do. And because um, I was covering bass duties for the straw dog so it's kind of doing two sets that's right that's right yeah. i forgot about that steve ended up sitting in with that agnostic, agnostic front again too which is yeah cool. that's great yeah he's <laughs> really a great uh guitarist and those leads that he lays down are uh yeah because he even at uh the show we did at uh the middle east i mean 
is is playing. It makes a big difference there. those Straw Dog songs when when he plays you 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 can tell it's different. He yeah. does a lot of like arpeggios um that you won't hear yeah. the other guys do and it and it really adds really adds a lot yeah yeah i met that's how i'm you know i i worked with the straw dogs at an enigma the restless uh label and that's when i first met steve and he ended we ended up becoming friends in new york because when i was doing giant records he was a writer and he reviewed all my records for oh, me nice. he did a great job he was a yeah He's a good guy. He was on he the is. show not too long ago. Nice. He's got Paul McCartney and, and the Foo Fighters now, so he doesn't really need us that much. You know? Well, <laughs> he's not like right. that, though. He's not like that. He's a good guy. Good guy. Absolutely. So um, I guess the obvious question is now, is there ever going to be another, you know, Jerry's Kids show with Brian? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You know, we did our kind of uh, final show. Um, a few years back at the Middle East, kind of made it an event. You know, I was really thrilled. Moving Targets played, Straw Dogs played, Mung played, which are, you know, I just think a phenomenal band. And then uh, we were very lucky in that uh, a number of the members of Bola Volta did a handful of songs, which again, one of my one of my favorite bands. Love that band. Um, you know, and uh, so that was that was a lot of fun. Um, and part of doing that was just to, you know, just kind of try to wrap everything up because we actually, we're all really busy and we get kind of nonstop. We were getting and still kind of get a nonstop request to do shows and to do it right takes a lot of work, especially if you're not doing, if you don't do that full time and you've got a regular job and, you know, we don't want to go out and just kind of, play songs and kind of stand there you know we wanted to play with the right level of intensity and that takes work and it takes work to be free on stage to really kind of um it shouldn't be work it should be being able to be in the moment and to be in the moment means you need to be rehearsed it's got to be muscle memory and ready to go and um if you're doing two or three shows a year it's it's with that type of music if you're not able to do that then you know you're just yeah. getting paid to do a show and it's, what are you really doing it's, um, it's two months it's two months of practices yeah. basically to do one show so if you're only going to do one show that's a lot of practice and then and then you know everyone is you know some of the practices are more productive than others yeah. just because people aren't in the moment. And... Yeah, I know there's bands that can get together and they're really great and they do one or two rehearsals and they get on stage and they do a phenomenal job. And, yeah. you know, even working with the Straw Dogs to kind of cover some stuff for them, you know, it's a couple practices and you can go because, you know, you're doing kind of one job with them and you can be in the moment um, and it's different music. You have a little bit time, more time to think. With that JK stuff, it's like uh, a rocket ship taken off. And the minute you kind of get that four count, it's like a different world uh, in terms of mentally and physically. And um, so we can't get away with one or two practices to get right. our level up to where it needs to be, to really be happy about what we're doing. And then we always, if people are going to come out to a show. We try to make every one a little bit different in terms of either arrangements, what we're doing. And, um, you know, we like to be able to throw stuff in that we don't necessarily know where we're going to go. So in order to like, even at that last show, we had some, various transitions that every time we did them we did them differently and you need to be in sync musically to be able to do that in front of um people and feel confident about what you're doing that hey we may do this for 30 seconds we may do it for two minutes uh we may uh, whatever toss brian the bass or we may switch some things up but you gotta be communicating without talking if that makes sense yeah and to be kind it. of in that kind of sync and free it takes a lot of work and and i think at this point you know people are 
people are looking for an experience to see what it what it was like if they didn't experience it. And and even though Jerry Skids isn't getting paid, they pay to go to the show. What? Right? Whatever. So <laughs> <laughs> We got paid most of the time. Yeah, uh, I mean, but I, I think that I think that it's important that people, you know, I think it's you know to to give them the honest show. Yeah. Um, because it doesn't do justice to the songs, the band, or the people that go to see it. Yeah. yeah you um, want to be able to deliver at that level. And yeah. If, and if, I, if I think it's answer to put the time in, then why do it? I yeah. appreciate it. I wish I was li wasn't living in Pittsburgh when that show happened because yeah. I remember hearing about it. I also missed the Chris Doherty benefit show, so I ended up missing like two really good shows. Um, I got to ask you, lovely. Was that just like a thing that you were doing for a few minutes and it's gone, or is that going to? No, be I mean we worked really. Uh, that was you know we put a lot of work into that. Um, wrote a lot of um, you know really collaborative writing with that team. It really just the pandemic yeah. made it hard for us to get together. Yeah. So the stuff that we put out, we we were like, we didn't know when we were going to be able to put it out. So, you know, we had it mixed, but we literally mastered it kind of remotely while the pandemic was going on. And then it just was hard to get together. And, and then a couple of the members ended up having some time constraints. So we just said, you know what, and we're paying for the rehearsals space all through the pandemic so we really wanted to play out and really test the material out live um but yeah we just couldn't um yeah we just couldn't get it uh pulled together with the time constraints so it we was ended good up, um, good we ended up it was shelving it. good it was good though yeah, <laughs> real good it. real good Hey, thanks a lot, you guys, man. I yeah, appreciate you. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I when I heard that I could get you both together, I, I, I had to jump on that, man. So thank now you. you realize what a mistake it was. Yeah, <laughs> it's like what was I thinking? These two knuckleheads. <laughs> you guys did a great man. job, man. Thank you so much. All right, thanks, man. Appreciate right. it. Take care, Steve.